This is two townhouses we built in the backyard of the central upper hut section. Coming up, we'll show you footage of the build from start to finish. I'll break down the design of these two builds and we'll discuss elements of the build in detail. Stick around to the end of the video to see the amazing finished home. My clients had raised their family in this home and lived there for a while. They actually did an extension to this area here and it was a little bit ironic that this area of the home that they had previously added onto the house was now being removed to make way for two townhouses. Two different times in their life, two different sets of goals. One of the first things we do when we consider a project like this is we look at the existing buildings in place that are going to get removed. We also look at the subdivision services plan. This here shows that the sewer is in the middle of the road. The water main connections are going here. We need to consider the new driveway and how that's going to interact with the old home. We want to make sure that the old house still maintains its look, feel and character and that fences and things go in natural locations so that everyone feels like they have their own space. At a high level, we've marked the outdoor areas, the car parks, this goes hand in hand with a proposed design. You can see on this page here, it shows the earthworks and where we're going to have to cut. These details are worked out from a topographical survey. It's important to get a feel for these things and make sure you're putting the building at the right height. You can see in this site set out plan here that we could set the building out ourselves using these measurements here to find the corners of the build. And I did learn to do this as part of my apprenticeship. However, as our sites get tighter, it gets more and more important to put the building in the correct location. So we've now opted to use a surveyor for every one of our builds. They will do what's called grid lines. They'll do a line along the back and a line along the side. We only needed to take out 200 mils of topsoil and replace it here with a minimum of 200 mils GAP 65 hardfield. And that gets laid in layers and compacted. The engineer comes back and approves that. Then we can crack on with our normal foundation process. We still put profiles up in every corner of the build. We mark the perimeter of the building with string line. That then gets used by the plumber as he puts the subfloor drains in and gets used by the builder to mark the edge of the concrete slab. Basically, before we do any building work, we are setting the building out with string. And then we move over to this foundation pan here. We make sure that the overall measurements add up on the sides of the buildings here. And we also make sure that these diagonals are right. These diagonals show that the building is perfectly square. For example, if this measurement here is 1957 instead of 37, and this one is 18890, it means that my overalls are right, but I've got a little bit of a parallelogram instead of a square and then I need to tweak the corners to make that work. And sometimes you'll see on a builder's profile, there'll be an initial nail and then there'll be another nail where they've moved the string line. Once we've locked in the line, we double nail it and we mark BL building line. It's really important to take your time at this stage because this is the time where it's the most easiest to make changes. It's also the time where it's easier to trip yourself up and carry on, and then it gets harder and harder to fix later. Not only do these measurements get double checked in-house, but then we, go, we have to pass a council inspection, showing them that we've put the building in the right place to the right dimensions. Then the boys got stuck into foundations that sand, polythene, formwork goes up, pods, steel, And you can see the layout for the pods here and where we need to put a thickening through the firewall. This thickening here ends up being a chunky steel cage and this detail for that is shown here. So now the slab is prepped and we can pour concrete. This is always an exciting part of the job and I like to say it is now set in stone.
Next up, frames come to site and we stand those being a single level, smaller build. This was a really easy process. We did have a firewall in the middle. You can see the detail for the firewall here. We are using a jib system. It's a simple solution that has a central barrier and a frame either side. We then finish with a 10mm layer of Braceline jib. Now that the house is taking shape and before I show you the floor plan, this is the perfect time for you to go ahead and click subscribe. Lot 2 was 78 square metres and lot 3 was 68 square metres, however lot 2 did have a single garage. Not only did we have to do a firewall here, but we had to do a firewall on this side here and that's because of the proximity to the boundary. This firewall here is double lined, this firewall here is single lined. Unit 2 here, you come up the drive and you park your car in the garage. You come through the front door and you turn right into a small lounge kitchen dining with a sliding door out into a closed-in patio area. Through the hallway you've got two bedrooms and a central bathroom. And back through the main living you have a pocket slider into the garage. Laundry in the back. Moving over to lot 3, you park your car here on the side and you come through the front door into your lounge and kitchen. You've got a slightly larger kitchen than lot 3. Again, a sliding door out onto a patio. This patio is tucked around the corner of the build, potentially a little bit more private than lot two. And similar, two bedrooms on the back and a main bathroom. While these homes are on the smaller side, this is a great example of adding two two-bedroom homes to the system that are available for rent or first-home buyers. Now that the frames are up, trusses come to site and we crack on with roof framing. We do the bracing, the purlins, the outriggers, the suffetes, and we're now ready for fascia to be installed. Once the fascia's up, the roofers come in, they'll lay their mesh, paper, and roofing iron, and we finish with all of the flashings. You can see a roofing plan here, it shows you the valleys and the ridges, and also marks where all of the downpipes need to go and how much each section of roof is catching. You can see here we have a 450mm feet overhang and that's marked, so that dotted line there is the edge of the building and it comes out another 450mm. Basically it's a giant hat for the building and is keeping as much water away from the critical points of your building as possible. Not only does it give you some protection from the rain, a little bit of shading, where possible overhangs and suffetes are a great idea. Now that the roof is on, we can crack on with the cladding phase. This begins with wrapping the building. We put cavity battens up. You can see here that we are using James Hardy linear bevel back weatherboard on a cavity. Bevel back is when the two weatherboards overlap each other, like this detail here, and it's getting painted two tone. Very traditional, great waterproof building method here in New Zealand. Now that we've clad the outside, we can move on to the inside. We get the plumber and the sparky in. We go around and we mark where every plug and switch is gonna go and talk with the owners about whether they want any electrical extras in the walls. We then do the same with the plumbing. Once all our pipes and wires are in the framing, we can finish off with insulation and we're now ready for our pre-line inspection. Once we've passed our pre-line inspection, we can crack on with jib and then get a post line inspection. A post line inspection checks all of the areas where we've used jib as a bracing element. You can see them marked on this page here and we follow the jib screwing pattern for a GS1 or a BL1. Now that the jib's been inspected, we can crack on with plaster, architraves, skirting, internal doors, and we get the painter back to paint the inside. This is where it really starts to look and feel like a home. We then put in the kitchen cabinets, we put the hard floor down, we put the carpet down. While this is all happening inside, we're cracking on with as many things as we can outside. We get the soap pit installed, we get the house drains hooked up to the mains, we start preparing all of our areas for driveways, patios and lawns. We put in any remaining fencing that needs to go up 
and we pour our concrete outside. Baki and Plumber come back and do all their finishing touches. The builder puts on the door handles and the door stops and the toilet roll holders. We hang the mirrors. Now it has well and truly changed from a house into a home. Let's take a look at the finished home. Personally, I'm stoked with how much space you feel like you've got in the kitchen. You've got a breakfast bar here, enough for three stools. Dishwasher, sink, you've got this huge above bench cupboard. Stone bench top goes all the way through. Heaps of room for your appliances. Cooking over here, we've got the fridge in here and another pantry just in here. Got a living room there. We've got a little outdoor yard over here. Outdoor living, garden shed. What else do you need? Down here we've got two bedrooms and a bathroom. Master bedroom with a nice gigantic bed. Bedside tables. Wardrobe with organized storage. Another room over here. Could be for a flatmate, could be for a child. Could get some bunks in here, You've, or, or even a work from home office. Again, great space, great size. Bathroom, I mean, shower, toilet, basin. Uh, and we have got the laundry cupboard. 69 square meters, single story, off street parking. Town is like a five minute stroll that way. We've got the supermarkets over there, we've got the doctors, we've got the cafes. Awesome spot, awesome location. We love being a part of the build. We love doing this kind of work. If you've got a backyard that you want to do something similar, give us a bell.